Oper Operational Excellence Panel, and it's going to be moderated by Andrew. So I'm going to ask Andrew to come to the stage. And he is known as uh, Molly. You may, know, you may better know him as Molly. He describes himself as a bohemian that lives on an island, off an island, um, because he is, um, I guess, off of, off of Victoria, right off of Vancouver Island. Um, he is these a couple of things that you may or may not know about him. He is he is very dedicated. I will tell you, he was stomping the grounds, helping to put this thing together, working nights, working weekends, really pounding the pavement. We couldn't have put this on without him for sure. Um, and if you've read any of his stuff, you will know that one of the things he really loves to do is take things that are really, really complicated and break them down, deconstruct them so that the average person like me can understand what the heck he's talking about. So welcome, Andrew, and thank you for moderating this panel for us. A pleasure to be up here, especially following a luminary, <laughs> thought leaders. Um, two things today that are really important to myself in communication. One, you'll hear it, point of reference. Reference points are very important. The second thing I'd like you to take away or enjoy with this is perspectives. Because my partner, Blue, has different perspectives of myself. It really rounds out not only the conversation, but a lot of the things you're going to hear today, advanced manufacturing, new product platforms, vapes, impact, edibles impact into the unfolding market. I'd like you to listen for them today. Speaking of thought leaders, would you, would you like to come up here, please? We have our operational excellence panel. We have Jeanette Vandermorel from 48 North. Nathan, <laughs> wherever you like, I'm just going to be here. Nathan Woodworth. Oh. No mic? I got a mic. Oh, yeah. hey, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, and welcome, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleased to be here today. Thank you. Excellent. We're going to be covering a fair bit of ground right now, but I'll just take a moment for uh, anybody who's unfamiliar. Maybe we can start with Jeanette and introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Jeanette Vandermerrill. Uh, grew up kind of a funny background in agriculture and in healthcare, and they kind of collided and became cannabis. Um, yeah, back in 2011 and earlier 2012, my husband and I founded the Green Organic Dutchman, uh, a large company. We still always say we're proud founders and happy shareholders of that company. And I thought about retiring, and I realized I failed at something that was retiring. So I started another company called Good and Green. Um, it was the fastest to license ever in six months from start to finish. And then late last year, we merged that company with 48 North, which is already a publicly traded company. So now we're the big family of 48 North. We have two licensed cultivation sites and anxiously, anxiously awaiting our license for our 100-acre outdoor organic farm. Woo. <laughs> uh, my name is Nathan Woodworth. I'm the CEO of James E. Wagner Cultivation. Uh, I began my career in this industry as a patient under the MMAR and uh, a longtime grower. Uh, we named the company after my grandfather because, uh, of course, he was the one who uh, taught me a lot about agriculture and about growing cannabis in particular uh, in my younger days. And uh, he's a big inspiration to us. Uh, we founded uh, JWC in uh, early 2014. It took us a lot longer than six months to get our license, uh, but we're now a licensed producer of cannabis in southern Ontario with a couple of facilities and growing quick. Hi, uh, Brett Marchand. I'm the uh, SVP of Ops of uh, Afria. I, uh, I'm relatively new to the industry. This is my fourth month, um, but they tell me every day is like seven days, um, so I'm dog year, so I guess I've been here for a little bit longer than that. Um, my background is supply chain. Um, I started in the military as a logistician, uh, moved into the oil and gas industry, spent five years there running a supply chain North America and wide. Um, then moved into the fast mover consumer, consumer goods with Maple Leaf Foods. Um, moved from there with, to Lactalis in, uh, in the U.S., running their supply chain for the largest cheese manufacturer in North America. Um, and uh, found myself um, in, uh, in Winnipeg, where I spent the last three years serving indigenous um, uh, northern communities. Um, very difficult supply chains, uh, providing them with, uh, with all the sustenance for life. Uh, and then moved to, uh, to Leamington, back home where I grew up in, uh, in southwestern Ontario, about 15 minutes away from Leamington, so I'm really happy to be there. I love the industry, and thanks very much for having me. 
Uh, so my name's Dieter McPherson. I as well am a SVP of Ops for Aurora Cannabis. Um, I've been in it a little longer than four months. I'm actually <laughs> a very young and handsome individual, but this industry <laughs> tends to do strange things to us. Um, so uh, pretty similar, it's all encompassing role, just generally around cannabis, whether it's primary, secondary supply chain, logistics, manufacturing, production. So uh, the end-to-end -end value chain, thankfully I don't deal with sales or any of that fun stuff, so uh, a bit of a ground pounder, but uh, it's been an interesting ride to say the least, and give yourself another year and a half, and <laughs> I'm sure you'll look just like me. <laughs> Thanks, Dieter. <laughs> Even in the last six months, we've seen a transition in dog years of cannabis to now we're in a period of RAM. And before we get into advanced manufacturing or into uh, new products or whatnot, um, I actually wanted to start with you, Nathan, because as a grower, as a producer that's growing, I wanted to see if there was any, through your experience or your own uh, moments, um, we've heard a lot about challenges in scaling production. And typically, it, it, it can be different words or different flavors for describing those challenges. Um, did anything in particular bear out for you as particularly challenging, problematic, perhaps easier while you were scaling? I think when we're talking about scaling, we are talking about really one of the core difficulties and problems that we face in this industry, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's production or supply chain, growing our, our businesses to be able to face the uh, total national challenge uh, is a difficulty. Uh, when dealing with production in general and all of these issues, I think we first need to recognize uh, the basic module of scalability, that is, what it is we're scaling. And when we intensively understand that, then it becomes easier to translate that to a larger scale. Uh, at JWC, we began with a pilot facility where we learned to implement our unique cultivation methodology uh, at scale, a very small scale to begin with, but by an intensive mathematical understanding of what was going on there, we developed a paradigm that could then be be translated forward and brought up to a larger scale, which is what we're in the process of doing now. And luckily, the math has helped. Uh, we are able to, uh, you know, quickly and easily implement that new paradigm into a new, spa a new space. Uh, and when it comes to operation within a new production space, it largely follows the same principle. Once you learn to uh, you know, complete a procedure in a given area at a given scale, once you intensively understand that procedure, it then translates into the new space at a new scale very easily. Uh, and of course, that follows all the way through when we're talking about uh, you know, production through to harvest and inventory and so forth. Uh, I think that uh, there are two major difficulties that sort of stand out to me in terms of challenges uh, when trying to shift to a new scale. Uh, and the uh, first is the logistics of uh, what we're talking about today, which is really uh, that sort of overall supply chain management. In converting inventory into finished products, we have so many different pathways that can be considered and they all take a different amount of inputs and different timelines and it all needs to come together in the end uh, in order to meet our goals and our deadlines and so that becomes uh, you know a completely different problem and uh, a much more complex uh, element which is really what we're here to talk about today because that's about to get a lot more complicated for us uh, of course the other issue is one which I'm constantly battling with and that is the horizon of scalability certain processes make sense at a given scale. And then we think that if we're going to double that, we're going to be able to do that at twice the scale. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes there are hidden horizons and these processes <laughs> break down as we begin to scale them up. And we can't always anticipate where those horizons are. Uh, and so we have to learn to be flexible uh, within a rigid and complete understanding of that total process so that we can roll with the punches when we come up against one of these hidden horizons. And I think that's been our biggest challenge. We've run into a couple of them. Uh, you know, uh, with facility contr control and uh, you know maintaining certain uh, post-harvest processes also can become uh, you know a major load issue uh, which all of a sudden just skyrockets once you reach a certain scale uh, but uh, luckily so far we've managed to uh, you know keep our wits about us and uh, come out unscathed when dealing with all of those new challenges uh, I'm smiling when you were talking because you've, you've brought in two of the largest elements, I think. Uh, it's particularly in scaling is that one, 
a moment where something cannot be scaled. You cannot put five liters of milk in a two-liter container. Is it where, or you get, well, you get, sometimes the two-liter container at five liters doesn't hold up anymore, and we didn't <laughs> expect it. You know? So exactly, yes, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Darryl, and, and the second thing that I tease out of that definitely is, is that if you do have an impediment earlier on in the supply chain, that's going to domino. Oh, right? that's gonna just they, it'll cascade, okay. yeah, and you can fall behind real quick. Absolutely. I see one of the challenges in this, and, and it is you brought up a good point of being flexible and being able to pivot quickly, uh, because it is important. We have to think on the fly and uh, uh, within the regulations and finding ways to be creative and in, in, com in compliance. But as you scale, there's new challenges that come up, and, and you have to move very quickly and hope that the regulator keeps up with what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, we, we used to be able to solve a lot of problems with hard work uh, and pulling up your suspenders and bootstrapping. When you get to a certain point, uh, people are no longer the solution to a lot of your problems because A, you can't hire enough to actually manually solve problems that fundamentally either have to be process driven or automated, or two, you're just driving everybody so hard they're burnt out already, so good luck getting an extra 25% of them when something goes wrong. Um, so yeah, it, oftentimes uh, the reward is linear, but the problems are logarithmic, which is unfortunate, but it, it just starts to get that way. Yeah. Um, um, and, and you mentioned throughput, which throughput, uh, especially within supply chain, and so it's been a big focus of the catalyst lately, is to see the throughput that moves from uh, pr initial product to work in process, to inventory, to finished goods. Um, is there anything from your perspective, perhaps either in supply chain uh, or uh, from your perspective, Dieter, that's the most difficult point of transformation within that? Is there a particular moment that becomes the tractor pull? I'll take the first half of that one. Go ahead. I'll say I've never read so much about constipation in my life. <laughs> I'm buying stocks in Metamucil <coughs> next week. Um, as, um, as we add new products and new forms, um, uh, new provinces, uh, you're looking at a complex matrix. It's not as simple as just adding one new product. Um, so I think everyone is pretty well aware of the act of agriculturally producing the crop. I think there's a lot of talent. I think we've pulled in from the grain and black markets, people from Maple Leaf Food and others that are really able to uh, bring in best practices from other industries for the ag portion. The, the manufacturing side at scale for uh, a, one, a non-fungible commodity, and that's probably heresy in some circles, but dry cannabis fundamentally at this point is non-fungible. I think when we get into new product forms, we're gonna talk about some fungibility and interchangeability. Um, it gets uh, really difficult because it, you're, you're building a plane while you're flying it. So I think putting it in the bottle is probably part of the, the easiest part in manufacturing. It's when we get to um, kind of uh, multiple SKUs, shipping across the country, timing, uh, dealing with provincial customers that have been buying liquor for you know 70 years. So their expectations of an industry is based on very large partners that have grown together, whereas we're relatively young and, and pretty stupid as far as you know a large CPG market would be considered. So I, I don't think there's necessarily one problem, but there's been a pretty consistent. Um, not necessarily underestimation on the part of the, the, the licensed producers, but um, we, we as, a, as an industry are moving so incredibly fast that I often think we don't get enough credit for what we're attempting to do and largely doing successfully. Having said that, yeah, there's some problems and when we add new product forms, oh boy, is this gonna get even more fun. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think, Dieter, you, you hit it on the head. The biggest issues that we have here, um, actually, there's a little bit of Nathan's in it and a little bit of Dieter's in it, right? Because we are, we are ramping up that production. We're finding where we hit those walls. Mm. Um, and, and sometimes there, there, there are surprises to where you hit that wall. But as well, we're dealing with a lot of gray space still. So I'm used to being able to say, I know exactly what my customers want. Because um, I've got a demand that goes back five years, six years. And I can, I can laser define what that is. Today, we don't have an actual demand. On the med side, we do. We know what they need, we know what they want, we know what they're buying. It's changing as we expand. But on the, on the rec side, it's still basically allocation. So allocation doesn't give you a real nice demand picture. No. Nope. It basically says, here you go. Um, everything you get, put it out the door because somebody's gonna buy it and it's gonna get out in the market. That's a little bit different than what, than what you're used to. Um, but I think where we're still problems, um, with provinces that takes three steps to get a PO. 
or I could get a PO, I call up the buyer, I say, I've got something for you, I need to move it right away, can you take it, boom, out the door. In, in most of these provinces today, you get a PO issue, it has to be signed off by a second level and then a third level, right? So three levels, sometimes it takes two weeks to get a PO after you've got the product ready to go. So those are, those are challenges, right? Those are big challenges and, and that's where we're still living in that, in that world. And it, and it just gets worse, 13 jurisdictions, tax stamps that have to go on every single one of them, so you have to split your production ahead of time before you know what you're, so there's a, there's a challenge to it for sure. I'd, I'd also add that um, no industry like this has grown at an average, what do we say, 20, maybe, we'll call it 25% quarter over quarter average over the last two years. No other, no other industry has that type of growth consistently over two or three years, and it, it, it's very difficult. And when you're looking at things like single source suppliers, so you know, oftentimes we're all pulling from the same bucket, uh, Salbro, Moldrite, anybody, I'm sure you're using the bottles out there, 80% of us, so there's a great deal of risk there. And, and a very good example would be uh, most other CPG industries, certainly around food, tobacco, and alcohol, have seen the same regulatory environment, give or take some small, small changes over 20 years. So there's certainty there. there there's, there's bankability on the things you can control and the things you can't control. A good example would be, I don't know who's checked their email this morning, but Health Canada just announced a fundamental change in licensing that says you can't even apply until your facility is completed. Out of nowhere, out of the blue, turn the whole industry upside on its head. I just got that email this morning. My phone is now vibrating nonstop. <laughs> it explains why mine is too. Yeah, you, exa exactly. And, and, and these changes and moving the goalpost, where we've got regulatory capture, uncertainty, elections coming up, new regulatory uh, forms coming in, or uh, I don't know if Shane's here, where he likes to say the Gazette and publication and, and, and you know, having input on these. We don't get any of that. So it's, it's, it, there's <laughs> so many variables. It, it's fun, don't get me wrong. But like I said, I'm, I'm aging at a very rapid rate right now. <laughs> I think Ugh. this comes to exactly the point you made, Jeanette. The, the concept that in the early days, we were used to being able to hit these problems and then pivot into a solution. Yep. Now we're dealing with regulators on so many different levels across the board uh, that we find ourselves hemmed in uh, and unable to create innovative solutions to solve these new problems. Uh, so it's becoming harder and harder and many of our resources are becoming depleted and we are drawing from many of the same resource pools. Uh, so it uh, you know, uh, is going to become more and more of a crunch in my opinion. And this issue with Health Canada actually uh, highlights something that uh, I felt is sort of a growing problem uh, in that arena recently because their resources are stretched thin, yeah. uh, as with many regulators who are dealing with this new and growing industry. Uh, and that is not going to get any better in the near future. So, uh, you know, it's germane to the whole question that we're asking today uh, around these new, uh, you know, product types. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go. Uh, with um, anybody, I was born and raised in Calgary, and, uh, and for the older folks in here, or people who have been through a boom know that managing growth as a business is one of the most challenging. You know, some folks might think that, oh, we, you know, uh, we're so busy, it's great. Sometimes it can be not only destructive in not being able to service. I mean, if you, if you don't have any customers walking through your door, you have a pretty simple, identifiable problem to have. Mm -hmm. When you have too many customers and too many issues, it can be uh, hard for resource allocation. And the, the spark that makes these companies great can be destroyed with growth unless you very carefully maintain your culture and set some clear goals. And, you know, the heart of a cannabis company fundamentally is a pretty weird product, so you got to like what you're doing. And if that growth is unmanaged, then, yeah, I imagine we'll all end up wearing suits. Thankfully, I'm not quite there yet. No offense. <laughs> but, but it's true. If you're, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're bringing people in from, from other industries, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, who may or may not be a user, and they're coming in and, and you get into that culture. Um, thankfully, the majority of my team um, are rabid users. Um, that's a good thing, um, honestly, because they, they take such care and pride in the product and they won't let us make a mistake. Um, but as you start to dilute that um, and you start bringing people in who are just straight CPG and we're gonna run it this way and, and put the iron, um, you know, the iron braces on everybody. This is exactly what we're gonna do. This is, there's no, no um, way around it. We're gonna produce like crazy. We're gonna drive this through the market. We're gonna sell, we're gonna ship. Um, without understanding that culture, without understanding what makes it different, um, yeah, it can be a problem. I agree. I think culture is one of the biggest things in the company. 
and it's obviously the management's job to make sure we keep that culture. We're growing fast. We're going to probably double our, our company this this year. Mm -hmm. And it's bringing in people that are integral to those pieces, but also fit into the culture. And it's interesting, as a growing organism or organization, uh, certain people that did have a role, whether they change or the role becomes more defined as we grow, uh, but that's one of the biggest challenges is managing that growth, bringing the right downstream, and still keeping oversight on your key management people, because now we're getting three and five and eight levers deep, and it's tougher. So yes, it's a big challenge as we grow quickly. I think it comes back to what I was saying about that module of scalability. You know, culture is an element that needs to be built into every fabric of what we do. Uh, and if it is respected from that basic element, uh, you know, we largely consider that individual plant to be our most primary uh, unit of scalability. Uh, and from there, every other process unfolds. And so culturally, if we build that in from the ground floor, it doesn't matter if we end up wearing suits or not, we still uh, maintain that uh, original yeah. uh, old school paradigm. Uh, about the quality and the product and the respect for the total process that we bring to it. Yep. Um, moving along, I wanted to talk about new production methods and uh, specifically, uh, Jeanette, you're speaking about regulations, change, adaptation. Um, the first applicant for Outdoor Grow. Yeah. Um, uh, the plant itself is quite adapted to in its environment. Um, and right now, we're, I, know, I think we all can agree to some degree that the plants aren't necessarily purpose-built yet. Not yet. They're not purpose-built for perhaps greenhouses, or the genetics are not quite perfectly aligned with the type of product that we um, get out. Growing outdoors is a different paradigm for several reasons. We're still growing a plant, but cost, scale. I wanted to ask you, Jeanette, um, particularly what, if you can elaborate, what do you think when outdoor comes online, um, it will mean to existing production? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think we're always going to need high quality indoor grown cannabis, especially for patients who need consistent quality uh, from lot to lot and batch to batch and over months. So they want to be able to buy the same medicine in June or January. And they're going to get that consistency in dried flour only from controlled indoor agriculture. But as far as farming, and that's really where my heart is, uh, I think it's a game changer. I really do think it's disruptive uh, to the industry. We are growing organically as well. Um, but the cost to produce indoors is one of the, our problems why we can't compete with the black market. The cost to grow outdoors will be much lower. So our plan is roughly 80% of our product grown at the farm, which will be 40,000 kilograms. We'll have 3.7 million square feet of canopy outdoors. Uh, so it's a huge cultivation and a huge logistics challenge. Uh, so 80% will go for extracts, next generation products, uh, vape pens, topicals, cosmetics, those products. 20% will be sold as dried flour. We just did a uh, landmark agreement with the SQDC in Quebec. They have actually signed a purchase agreement for our outdoor grown cannabis, outdoor sun grown organic cannabis, which we're thrilled with. Uh, we're the first one that's uh, signed an agreement, so we're excited about that. But I, I think there has to be more outdoor grown. I think it will happen. Um, you know, the average age of a farmer in Canada right now is over 50. This is a new agricultural crop where Canada can really take the lead. We do grow really good outdoor cannabis. The only reason cannabis went indoors was because it was illegal. It's, we don't grow any other commodity for extraction or processing indoors. We don't grow grapes or canola or soybeans indoors. They're all outdoor grown agricultural crops that are processed into food or pharma products. So it is inevitable and it's surprising it's taken this long to get there. We're really excited. Uh, bigger challenges, it's new to Health Canada. And I've got to say, I always give them a shout out because they're the hardest working people in, in Ottawa. They really are working hard. But this is new. So there's things like asking me for I, cameras identifying people entering and exiting rooms. There, it's 80 acres, there's no rooms. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so things like that, uh, helping them to understand the logistics and, and the seasonal realities too, where we're really anxious to begin growing this spring. We do have to get on it. We've had great communications with Health Canada and I, I think that they truly understand the need to help us address the supply deficit and also bring a lower cost product to the market to help us compete with the black market. Uh, we have a lot more compliance than black or gray market growers do, so our costs are higher. Uh, one way we can level that playing field is by growing outdoor and having a lower cost input. So we're really excited about it. So it's not as if you can go down to the local uh, Massey Ferguson and get a Acme cannabis picker machine for the field. So I imagine you're growing out, this, or you're building the modality, or laying the track as you're going. So we're really lucky. We're working with a lot of local farmers, also Ministry of Agriculture, um, a lot of different groups to try to grow this plant effectively uh, and within compliance of Health Canada, which is around sanitation and personal protective equipment. 
Uh, so, but it's creative. So I grew up apple farming. So apples, we, we can make money. Um, we have to prune the trees in the wintertime. We spray them numerous times. We hand thin, we chemically thin the apples, trim the suckers. We pick each tree at least three times. And we can, we can make money on apples. So I'm certain, even though it's labor intensive, we can definitely make money on cannabis. Uh, I think next year there'll be a lot more farms. Uh, we were just, I, growing up farming, I knew what our muddy springs are like. So I knew that in the fall I had to really push hard to get our fencing, our infrastructure, our security measures, all those things in really, really quickly. Uh, so we jammed it in, had it done by December, and uh, we're very hopeful with Health Canada that we should be licensed imminently. Only, th only thing I'd add around Massey Ferguson is friends don't let friends drive red tractors. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, and, you dare. <laughs> and so with respect to existing production, Nathan, do you see uh, flour as a modality, indoor high quality grown flour, specific either medical or specific purpose? won't be touched per se by an outdoor or? I think what there you... is some overlap uh, and I know it's sort of a, an interesting position for me to take as someone who's devoted to the indoor cultivation but I have been an outdoor grower of cannabis uh, and that's where my grandfather uh, you know spent most of his life growing cannabis uh, and uh, so it is a very challenging endeavor you know uh, I know you've made the comparison traditional agricultural products and there are a lot of similarities but this is a plant that has been bred differently uh, when you compare for instance uh, to apples where we're dealing with very specific varietals uh, that have been you know, bred to meet certain <coughs> challenges environmentally. Cannabis is not purpose-built, uh, as you've said. Uh, and until we have a purpose-built item, I think you're going to rely a lot on your system and your master grower, uh, who has to have a lot of experience in you know, local agricultural conditions uh, in order to drive those numbers. But the number you named is actually very close to where I would put it, uh, you know, in terms of uh, there being a percentage of that crop that will be considered comparable uh, within the realm uh, of high quality dried flour and that is still going to be something that happens. Uh, you know I think you also hit the nail on the head in regards to consistency when it comes to medical uh, and I will I think go one step further and say that even within recreational uh, there will be those who will uh, want the value add uh, of the uh, you know consistency assurance that's granted by a controlled indoor uh, you know uh, cultivation facility but this is a broad <coughs> market uh, and there's more than enough space for both. Uh, and I would certainly hate to see, uh, you know, the traditions uh, that my grandfather pursued, uh, you know, fall away simply because I choose to pursue something different. So I applaud those uh, who are going to uh, go that route and continue to keep outdoor cultivation alive in Canada. Um, as those perspectives, I want to talk, um, we have ostensibly outdoor, indoor and hybrid, as it were, a greenhouse. Um, I'd ask, uh, it, it might be a little bit less impact directly to your production, say, Brett, um, but do you think seasonality of pricing, is this another distortion or perhaps a new entrant that if we do see outdoor come, we're a Nordic climate, we're going to get presumably product like we have every 50 years coming on stream in the fall. Do you, do you see any potential price disruption or seasonality in that price signal or that spot price? Okay, I'll, if I put my my ops hat on. Um, obviously, if it's available um, at the right price, we'd, we'd look at bringing it in. Of course, it'd be to augment what we already have. But if, we're, if our current grow conditions are such and we're, our yields are right and, and our facility is flat out running, um, there wouldn't be the opportunity necessarily to, to bring it in. So it, it all depends on capacity, in my mind. Um, first of all, can it be can it be processed? Can it be moved through the network? Can it be moved through our facility? If I'm looking at, if I'm hitting all my marks, I'm probably not reaching out um, for a lot of product to run through the facility um, outside of what we're capable of producing. So that's that's the first, and and so what capacity there is, um, and that will build out. So if if we've got over capacity and we bring it in and we can we can put it through the facility, we we've got the right extraction methods. Um, sure we could see a price drop, um, it could be seasonal. We see that right now, it's, it's reflected in the hemp market, for example. If you've got hemp um, right now, you're probably getting a premium for it. But hemp come October, that's gonna drive it. And the more people get into the market, the farther that, that's gonna go down. So outdoor has definitely the p potential to drive price down. Um, whether that's seasonal, uh, it all depends on the, the ability to store that product and run it through the hole. So a lot of hemp 
uh, manufacturers today, uh, just to equate that, are figuring out the storage methods, right? So they're converting it from, from raw hemp, and the raw plant, and they're doing things like palletizing it and pelletizing it so that it can be stored much easier and moved through. So there are all kinds of options for that to smooth out the supply chain so it might not be seasonal if, as long as we got the storage methods and we've got the ability to store it. Um, challenge there is you've got a big gr outside grow and you're going to need to have licensed space to hold that. So that's one of our strengths is our farm is actually 10 minutes from our licensed 50,000 square foot warehouse. Uh, so we certainly, have, that was some of the logistics we're working on is, is transfer station storage, uh, bulk storage and then processing. We're doing, uh, we've announced a couple extraction uh, deals that we're doing as well. But yeah, it's how do you store 40,000 kilograms of dried cannabis all at once? Uh, so it was making sure we have the space allocated for that. Uh, within our existing license facility. Uh, and luckily, the logistics are it's 10 minutes away. So, yeah. Interestingly, there always has been a seasonal price variance in the black market. Uh, and that has always been a fact of things. And uh, you know, I think that what we're going to see here is that there is a price variance, but it's different uh, in terms of the logistics of uh, managing to get these products to market. So there's going to be long-term repercussions and ripple effects uh, which occur over the course of the year uh, as a result of the infusion of this extra bump of production from the summer crops. Uh, but it isn't going to match up to what we're used to seeing. Uh, so there will be repercussions, but they're pretty unpredictable as of yet because we don't know. Uh, you know we're, we're, you're forging new ground here, so uh, we really don't know what it's going to look like and what that timing is going to be uh, when it all unfolds. So we're like trying to pick out a demand supply forecast at this moment with so many moving parts. Um, speaking about supply demand forecasts, Dieter. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> um, we heard Chuck this morning touch on several moments of the new product platforms. And October 17th, 2019 is barreling to us. I know that uh, Aurora is active in product development. Um, there's, uh, so far, we've seen a limited number of SKUs. Um, production is ramping, you're overcoming your challenges. Um, decisions on new product platforms, whether they're being made this moment or not, or whether it's a little out. Um, I want to ask you from a perspective of not simply your, yourself and Aurora, but are you enthused about the new product platforms? Is this something you just want to dig your hands into? Is it something that you might be a little tentative about? <laughs> uh, I think the consumer is expecting it because there's a, a legacy market that, that uh, has built this demand. It's inherent, um, whether it's, uh, you know, you look to the United States or just what exists in, in Vancouver, Toronto and the other markets or, you know, the people that have been making brownies for, for 60 years and going to Grateful Dead concerts. I don't know. Uh, the, the, it, there's a demand there, so it needs to be served one way or the other. You know, we often hear people talking about competing with the black market. I, I think that's probably framed incorrectly. You, you, you co-opt, adopt, uh, and out-compete in all sorts of uh, kind of um, uh, verticals, whether it be cost, service, uh, product type. There, you know, there's lots of ways to, to improve the experience and offer it, and I, and I think uh, everyone's moving very quickly to this this next phase, whether it be you know vape cartridges and vapes generally, which is uh, widely seen to be the, the the largest sector in the United States. Um, you look at some of the the baked goods and edibles. I think those are likely a little bit smaller. Then you've got gummies and a few others. That data is available in the United States. We're not sure exactly how it's going to port over. This comes down to those demand plans. You know uh, the best laid. Uh, plans of mice and men. We can run Monte Carlos all day, but it's only as good as your, your feedback loop on that data. And, and even in the United States, without the regulatory capture and the structure that we're going to be going into where we have end-to-end -end supply chains, some direct to retail, some to wholesale, there's all sorts of variables and, and risks there. So yeah, I'm, I'm very excited, but I'm also worried genuinely because we're, we're, we're entering into food products First of all, so the, the risk is, is so much larger when you're dealing with, you know, even simple things like eggs. If you have an egg in your product, oh boy, you better have everything dialed. Not only should you, but every single point down that supply chain all the way to the stores. Um, I think we can get there. I, I would... I think I'm safe in saying we're not there yet as, a, as an end-to-end -end supply chain. So as much as we're going to be working really hard on new product forms, operating in regulations that still aren't finalized, whether it be peel-back labels or trying to, you know, we were talking about small form factor CRC packaging and how to get all the information on it. Who knows? Then we put out a large package, and of course, if you're on Twitter, we all get grief for it. It's like, well, there's probably a reason for it. Um, and then it, when we get to that, that kind of cold storage, 
storage, cold chain. Uh, this is out of our hands. This has to actually be a collaborative experience where it shouldn't be necessarily a competitive advantage to just have safe goods in the hands of the consumer. So whether it be Health Canada in some part, the provinces, you know, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I don't think Health Canada audits the provinces right now, which is just a little weird considering they're a huge portion of that supply chain. So there's a lot of work to be done. But yeah, I'm genuinely excited, also a little bit scared, which I think is good. Otherwise, I'd be so arrogant that I'm probably going to make the same mistakes twice, <laughs> which I don't want to do. Anybody share the enthusiasm or, or the yeah. fear? Yeah. 100%. You know, oh, both. All both. of those sentiments. I, I think we do. Um, and I think there's parts of it that, that excite us more than other parts of it. You know, we talked about the food and we talked about just just the safety inherent safety factors mm. and and the higher level of standards for a food product um, that you, that you're going to need um, the packaging right now on the food side the 10 milligram um, is a huge problem from a from a packaging supply chain operational um, tax stamping on a 10 milligram wow. today um, if you think about it and if you look at 10 milligrams if you went if you went to California today 10 milligrams is is the highest state of microdosing, so, <laughs> right, um, it, so it, it microdosing, is. sure, so, no, and, and we're talking about 10 milligrams yeah, as yeah. the largest capacity or the largest sample at this point. I, I, would, I, I would agree and disagree, I just want to put my two cents in here about 10 milligrams, I don't think it's necessarily the dose size, it's the number of doses in every package. So that's right. Um, if you, yeah, exactly, and well, we're, we're, we're waiting to see, we don't well, know, yeah. <laughs> go figure. Um, but the, uh, it, it adds complexity because if you, if you look at the dollar value of something like that and then you multiply it by the demand where the average bucket size and purchase is $32 and between $32 and $38 for an in-store purchase is kind of where it's balancing out and we see that in the United States, then you look at that 10 milligram dose, you, you, the, the volume that we're shipping is starting to make Amazon <coughs> you know, pale in comparison. It's just so many small units, it, it's pretty difficult and we ship a lot of error which is also difficult. Yeah, you know, we looked at it like basically around 200,000 to 250,000 jumps to 900,000 with the introduction of edibles, but the actual edible market is such a small percentage. Yeah. That extra um, number of packages going out is, is phenomenal based on the, the relatively short or small demand that we've seen in places like California, right? As a percentage well, of that. And on top of that, we have to deal with then with foods. Uh, we now fall under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or the CFIA. We have to comply with them as well. And then we have product stability and shelf life. And with provincial distributors, sometimes not getting things to the shelves, to the stores in a timely fashion, they could be expired before they even get to a retail environment. So there's challenges there with edibles yeah, as well. Shelf stability is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of sounds like we're winding up here. Genuinely, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> we love it. Bear with us. We're, not, we're, we're, definitely we're all feeling sorry for ourselves. Yeah. It would sound like whining, but it highlights an important problem. And I think it all reflects back into that regulatory issue. Because in order to approve edibles, in order to get edibles on the shelf, we have to see a bunch of regulators come together on the right set of standards to make this happen mm. in a timely fashion. Uh, and I think the odds of getting all those ducks in a row, uh, you know, in short order is very, very low. So, you know, we're going to look to a lot of new product formats. I think edibles is going to be one of the hardest sectors to hit. Yeah. And in part because there is a perception in, uh, in our industry that it is a relatively low payout. Uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of people out there that are going to, you know, run to the stores as soon as edibles come out. A lot more people are going to be focused on some of those other elements, which are going to be a little bit easier uh, from a logistics and regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, vape cartridges certainly have their challenges. Other types of concepts traits uh, which are available and represent a reasonably large sector uh, in the uh, more mature markets of the U.S. Uh, are going to be lower hanging fruit and are going to be a little bit easier for us to get to, probably a little quicker for us to see approval on. Uh, there's still the problem of the CRC packaging for something that small, uh, but it's comparable to the same problem we face with the edibles in a 10 milligram dose. Yeah. Uh, you know, a thousand milligrams in a concentrate looks pretty much the same as 10 milligrams in your average edible. Uh, and so we're going to deal with the same set of challenges there. So hopefully we're going to develop a toolbox that's going to help us to get to a wide variety of these products, uh, but there are going to be some that are simply easier to get to, uh, and that's largely regulatory and logistical. Do you want to kick at this can? What's that? You want to kick at that can too? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but there, you're, you're not wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, CRC packaging is, is, is one of those things that we're all um, basically challenges with and struggling with. I, I say struggling, but I think we've got some solutions that are, that are coming to market. And, 
Um, we're starting to see some of those packaging manufacturers understand how big this is. Our needs, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're understanding our needs. So that was a challenge in the first place where it's like, you're just pharmaceutical. No, we, we want to market. We want to have a, you know, we want to have something that's slightly different on the market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we ran, as the catalysts are wont to do, we run around in the field, and um, we ran smack dab right in the middle of a supply chain. Uh, and it was in a retail store. We were out in, uh, uh, doing some boots on the ground work, and I, one of the examples just cued me into it. We, we got a tour, we went into their vault, wanted to see their space. They had, for an equivalent amount of space, which is a little bigger than a shoebox, standard shipping box, you guys might be familiar with them, one had one box had 30 grams of product in it. The next box beside it had 72 grams of product in it. And the last box had 43 grams of product on it. So within an equivalent space in a square, in a, in a limited, presumably, vault space, you have three very different carrying amounts and very different amounts to be sold. Um, and that supply chain just lets you know exactly where you are. Um, I wanted to ask, too, perhaps, do you see new product formats, Jeanette? Uh, do you see them incrementally expanding? Are they going to bring new consumers in? Is it going to dislodge some traditional use? Or are we looking for something, a, a moment here? I, I think, uh, looking in my crystal ball, I think that there will be a lot of new cannabis consumers uh, as we come with new formats, and also cannabinoids and a lot of other products, maybe not THC, but CBN for sleep aids or... Um, you know, obviously CBD is in everything now. Um, but it's going to be in our vitamins and our nutraceuticals. It's going to be, and with new consumption methods, whether it be one of the products we're making or will be making, is a fast-acting sublingual spray. It, the onset is roughly the same as inhaled. So I, I think those products, because there's people who don't want to smoke, and that's always been our traditional thing of smoke a joint. Um, so I think with new products and, and destigmatization, which of course Chuck was talking about earlier, I think we will see a lot of new consumers. And it's interesting, I was just in California a couple weeks ago and going to dispensaries there, because for us to decide what products to make is one of the biggest challenges. And we have to take the cues from jurisdictions like Colorado or California to see what consumers are buying there. And it's great to talk to the bud tenders and they say, you know, a certain demographic is using more of the topicals or the sublinguals, uh, you know, it's a different demographic is doing more pre-rolls and, and uh, vapes. So it's fun though to create these great products. Uh, and really just doing it right. Uh, we know that we have to have quality product in order to get market share. And there is no brand recognition or loyalty right now. People are asking for strains or a product category. They don't really know yet any brand recognition and that's one of our biggest challenges here. What's your highest THC? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 much, much to my chagrin, yep. Yeah. Well, we, we see that effect on the, on the medical side of the house, right? If we put a we put a, a product out on the med that's 17, 18, and we put something out that's 20. Yep. 20 goes way before the 17, 18. Um, and, you know, so it, there's a value perception. That, that's a there, there, there's, there's a perception of value there. Yeah. If you look at your dollar going further, um, I also think that we tend to live in a bit of a bubble because we we see and know that there's more characteristics to good product than just THC. Absolutely. So there's an element of educating the consumer and and making sure that our assumptions of what the consumer want are actually checked by market data. Um, obviously, we haven't seen a full year of sales, so it's really tough, but um, you know, the 80-20 rule applies. So 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your, your purchasers. They tend to be your, your super purchasers, but that, that doesn't, that, that's as it exists. The growth market where we're hopefully gonna bring on some new people, we have to design products and educate them and provide them in a way that they wanna purchase them. We're, we're, we're in a supply-constrained market, so all of our metrics are completely and totally hooped. Um, they, you know, they're pretty much meaningless if you're not offering the market enough choice to be able to move their dollars. And there's no portability right now. So you know, what we see right now is, is going to change drastically within the next, call it four months, and then we'll probably see year over year some pretty massive shifts. Mm -hmm. And part of that is gonna be competition for consumer eyes, shelf space, dollars, supply chain, all the things that have been talked about. Yeah. That, tees up, uh, that tees up supply chain <laughs> very well. I I wanted to, Brad, I wanted to plumb hey, you your, your experience. <laughs> um, because in supply chain logistics, <coughs> inventory control, right. um, or, uh, supply smoothing, which you've alluded to. Mm. Um, I wanted to see if you could share any experience from other categories or from other industry, per se, that product launch and supply chain stabilization from that initial plant. 
um, maybe you share some of your experiences or analogies of what you see coming down the tracks. Yeah, uh, um, from a product launch perspective, um, we we've adapted a, a process that uh, that's near and dear to my heart that, that we ran at Maple Leaf Foods for product innovation and then product commercialization. So we've we've adapted that, but there are there are pieces to it that didn't exist in the in the food side of it, even a highly regulated food industry um, in Canada doesn't have some of the regulations. So the regulatory piece, getting things approved so much further in advance, getting information through the regulatory side of the house before you even start to conceive about how this might be packaged, how it would be produced, um, understanding the, the inputs that go into that product, getting them approved, having a very limited amount of, of uh, approved vendors and approved products that can go into the, those um, new products. So that's a, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, the other part of it that, that is a challenge is, again, it's still a new and emerging market, so understanding if you're, if you're running a stage gate process and you say, yeah, we're going to bet on this, um, and not really having all the metrics that back it up. Um, somebody else's metrics, yeah, you can look at California or Colorado or one of the other legal states and you can say, what's it selling there? Does that, is, it, so is that something we're going to bet on? Um, that product's been in that market for this long. It makes sense. Let's do that. What's it going to cost us to manufacture? Then go into that next stage in development. So that's not entirely different than than what you'd see in almost any CPG organization. Um, so it tracks over, it maps over. Um, some of the other issues are are basically we're an integrated supply chain. So we grow, produce, we cut, we um, we run it through the facility. We then we make what what we want out of it. but So I have to be looking back, um, if I look at that cycle, and I have to look at what I'm going to plant, what I'm going to make it out of, what are the right um, characteristics for that end product. I'm looking back now three, four, five, six, seven months into the planning cycle. Um, so that's a challenge for if we want to innovate. If I'm going to hit an October market and I want a very specific strain in this product, I have planted that already. Whether the regulatory um, side of the house catches up or not, yeah. it's coming. It's coming down the line. I might have to make something else with it. <laughs> we might have to, you know, it'll go into something else. But today, um, that is the one challenge that's a little bit different. Uh, from the supply chain side of the house, again, um, new market, ramping up huge, huge volume ramps. Um, across the world, demand is is not satiated yet. So again, it's great. Um, we don't have all the facts. We don't have all of the information that we'd like to have, um, but we've got a pretty good idea what it's going to do over the next 12 to 14, 15 months at this point. Oh, so please we're tell looking me. out. Yeah. Um, you know, Share with us. at least at least we know what we're going to have to offer uh, yeah, and what we fair. think is is going to get uh, is going to get absorbed by the market. Um, but how fast this this uh, demand gets filled um, is really the, the real challenge, right? Is everybody's coming on. You, you talked about the number of licenses, or someone talked about the total number of licenses that are, that are now um, for growers and LPs coming on. It's a massive inflow of a product. And how that filters out in the system and how the, the different provinces fill their supply chain, um, that's, that's where the challenge is, is not really knowing how fast that demand is going to get filled. Well, you've surfaced two really important things. For our today's day and age, we swipe and click, if you, you know, and it's, we have an immediate gratification that through a biological organism may not be just as on demand as perhaps uh, right. your, your television. Um, this surface, you surface something there that, speaking of demand, this comes to the supply side. For me, to your perspectives, do, is anybody just going to hold back? Is there going to be a producer that's just going to say, I'm going to catch the next bus? And is this induced because is it, are we going to have a collective lack of perhaps new product categories? Or perhaps are those resources going to be very focused and targeted? And I'm not asking for the product roadmaps of you guys for the next two years or anything. I just see what your perception is. Do you have a, a, an assumption or perhaps a feeling that we're that this plethora of new categories and new products might be a little bit more staged over the next few years? <laughs> I think it would be very dangerous to hold back entirely. Uh, you know, this is going to have a profound impact on everything that we do. Uh, and so there has to be a plan in place. There has to be a, a way to, in a measured way, approach these new product categories. 
uh, you know, I think there will be those who hold back from specific categories. Uh, you know, uh, we've touched on the fact that edibles is a big challenge, uh, and those companies with a lot of resources, I'm sure, will, uh, you know, find a way uh, to push that across the finish line. Uh, and uh, you know, companies who have to run uh, a little bit more lean uh, are going to look at things from a bit more of a capex, uh, you know, sort of perspective and say, these are the products that we're going to target. They give us a good return. They get us a market presence mm. in these new products categories without having to burn through a whole bunch of walls, a whole bunch of difficulties as we implement. Oh, I'm sorry, Dieter, CapEx, that was the word. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. And it, 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 I think companies are now diversifying in what their targets are, whether it be just net revenue growth, cost management, uh, SG&A control. Um, right to win is always really important too, and there's a, there's a lot of lessons that were learned the first go about it's not as simple as just delivering product to market. Every time you add a new channel or a new SKU, you've got depth and volume you have to fill before you ever get to sales. And so the complexity as you add or try and compete in every single one can mean your depth is so shallow that you don't have shelf presence, there's no consistency, the consumer's not going to be able to ask for the same thing over and over again. And with the branding limitations, it's very important that you have some breadth and, and a lot of depth. Uh, and uh, like I said, I, I think it's the polite way to put it. The industry as a whole learned a lot the last go around, and uh, we're likely, and I'm, you know, I can't speak for everyone else, but everything is with more purpose, and we're tracking, and we have very clear goals for what we're going to do. And there, there, like I said, there does have to be a sense uh, for a right to win. We're seeing companies start to specialize a little more, and I think there's probably a sense in the market of which companies are going to go where. You know, I expect some of the smaller niche producers, uh, Dan Sutton's here, to maybe produce some sauce or some really neat PHO, and I expect others are going to go for more high-volume products. And that's just kind of, I think that needs to happen as well. But um, we shall see. Yeah. It, yeah, that's exactly right, though, Dieter, is, is kind of making, you're, we're making a bet of where, where we need to go. Um, so, you know, we've identified where we want to play. Um, but we haven't said we can't play or we won't play in these other markets, right? We need to we need to have something um, something developed that's going to fill um, the 90 95 percent of of the potential categories, and it may be one or two things that uh, that we may not do ourselves. We you know we may look for for a partner in that um, because because there's still a lot of gray space. So um, if if you find the right partner. Um, you might get into more than you had expected, but. It's almost an irony, by the time we finally finish scaling in production, we're almost facing a buy versus build decision again, or again. repurposing, or yep. whatever. Yeah. I don't know, I, I don't think anybody here is probably has, this, has the same facility they started with. Oh. The grow might be the same, <laughs> but the manufacturing has been ripped out six times over the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the product categories will be interesting, but there is only limited production right now, and then we're all, sequestering some of our production for next generation products. Uh, so the supply depth that I don't see shortening quickly. What do you guys think? You think it'll be a while? Uh, dry flour? I, I, I'm, two answers. One, I think we'll have lots of supply, and now it's, but then it's gonna come to, well, what does the consumer wanna buy? Mm -hmm. Two very different things. Um, I'm not going to predict where it's at, but you know, it, it, it generally takes 18, 18 months to two years for a, for a, a manufacturing or a, an LP to get up to speed. And there is a glut of licenses that are starting to come on board, and hopefully we see micros. So yeah, I, I think we're going to see some stabilization, but we're kind of running a dairy quota. Um, it's the weirdest thing. It's like, it's, it's like the National Energy Board all over again in Alberta. I shouldn't have said that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, for, for every kilogram the market adds, Alberta adds two more in demand because they have more stores. Mm. So, it, it, two, well, I guess that's three very different questions because we're artificially limiting demand right now all across the board. So, mm -hmm. yeah, who knows? I tell you, we were cheated. I felt cheated uh, until this week. So, I've been back to Alberta a few times making sure I'm... Uh, back home, not only visiting my parents, I've stopped at 20 dope stores, at 20 cannabis retailers. And that was the first time that I felt legalization. Alberta, of all places, too. I felt that right. this is here. In BC, it, woo, darn tootin'. We could walk in various stores, they had different flavors. We went in from, uh, from a day spa to a, a back of a garage. I mean, it was that kind of a span. 
people have selection, choice, availability. What a beautiful thing. And it's, yeah. it's really culminated for me. And I really cue in on this demand constraint. It's, you know, uh, the LPs are sometimes made out to be the bad guys. But I, I don't believe that to be the case at all. Um, quick blue sky to each of you. Maybe I'll start with you, Jeanette. Um, what's going to be the highest margin of the new form factors? Oh, geez. Uh, well, for question. us, I, I think with outdoor grown cannabis, we can grow, we're estimating our cost at 25 cents per gram, uh, bulk package. So I think every product we make from that, I, I think our dried flower will be, uh, I saw it in California, there's a lot of people lining up to buy sun-grown organic outdoor cannabis. So I think that's going to be our best product. Mm. Uh, California. <laughs> Oregon. And Oregon. <laughs> I like the uh, more niche concentrates. Live resins have a relatively uh, you know, high value add for a relatively low capex. Uh, I think they appeal to a fairly uh, narrow segment of the market, but those tend to be the higher consumers. Uh, so I think that that could be uh, you know, our best product and where we can really hit with some very uh, you know, niche high end elements uh, in the next uh, product cycle. Yeah, I, I think you're not. Um, you're you're pretty right. Resins for us, um, a uh, concentrates. I think those those have the ability to be um, uh, much higher uh, from a GP perspective for us. Um, I would say that uh, that the right elements, the right time of the year, we may see streaks where where it's where it's bud and a, a high end bud. But, you know, like a broken coast or something like that. We're going to earn more on it because the product is is selling for a higher rate and it's the right time of growing season. So, I think you got a bit of that going on too. Hmm. I don't know if I should answer that because I don't want to go to jail. I'm a public <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. Um, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is being recorded. Um, I like with anything, it's what. I agree with you. I've kind of already talked about some of the categories that everybody's expecting. I think there's some simpler ones, there's some more complex. Uh, I think uh, some of the main ones are going to be vape cartridges because they're very stable. I believe the consumer risk is fairly low. They're easy in the supply chain, that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, with anything, I think we're going to see some pretty heavy stratification in the, in the pricing and the brands um, as we add more choice. It'll be interesting to see the sensitivity around dried flour. So the, that analysis is really tough to do. Uh, so, um, I think it'll be, it, it, it's hard to know. Uh, I think the fungibility of a lot of these products where you're just taking a raw API, commodity grade, and then adding other stuff to bring value will really help. But when it comes to, to edibles and things with food ingredients, those are fixed costs and they're going to be the same whether I'm in uh, maple leaf foods or, or cannabis. So um, that should give you an indication of where your margins are going to be compressed as well as, as depending on how complex what your inputs are, um, how long they can stay on the shelf, churn rate, uh, hard to know. Right. There's a non-answer for you so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> it's pretty lengthy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a blowhard. That's I like the sound of my own voice apparently. <laughs> um, I really want to go on, like, there's so many things. Um, we're running a little lower on time. I want to open up the floor, the floor unless anybody would like to add anything. Oh, I'd like to Brandon's open it up questions. to the floor for questions, and I certainly hope you have a few questions out there, because I've got a thousand, and I'm sure there's a few more. <laughs> One, testing two, testing three. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, Brandon right here. Um, a lot of the issues you guys are speaking about are very close to the heart for me. We're building a giant gummy factory, so <laughs> logistics, shelf stability, all of that, very, uh, very close on mind. My question for you, around is the, is the CBD environment, though. Uh, I know we've, uh, it's something that's still in the future. Everyone's talking about concentrates, edibles right now, but we're seeing a CBD environment spin up, and I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what the consumption expectations might be and what the availability of supply might look like. <laughs> I, I think because it's a field crop, we skip the, the heavily regulated outdoor market where we're still not sure how it's going to look, and you just go straight to traditional ag. So it's going to be a race to the bottom for the, the fundamental component, the API, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, this is my beliefs, and I'm going to caveat this to say it's not the company's, but I believe a decade from now we're going to see that CBD is going to be kind of considered much like riboflavin is right now where it, it's more nutritional than anything. It's just going to be part of the, the, the food supply because the benefits are, are, are pretty clear now. That's, that's my own personal view. We'll see how it goes. But I think with the, the hemp market the way it is, they blow the lid off. We see some NHP changes. It's just going to be in everything. It's like Frank's Red Hot. 
everywhere. Yeah, I agree with that. I would add that I think there is some evidence to suggest that the uh, larger entourage effect is still present in the medical efficacy of mm -hmm. CBD, uh, and that really requires a high quality input uh, in order to maintain a full spectrum of secondary cannabinoids to support CBD's efficacy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will see CBD as an additive, but I think that's separate from the narrower band market of CBD as a concentrated medical factor, uh, which will still require some high quality inputs. And there, actually, demand is high and supply is relatively short. Uh, so it is something that uh, has two faces to that particular issue. Right. And there's also the challenge about uh, the distribution of CBD-based products. We know that there's a lot that are sold in corner stores, but they're not legal products. Yes, yeah, CBD. <laughs> um, so in the United States, it's confusing because CBD is obviously, uh, after the Hemp Act, is now sold everywhere. Here in Canada, only a licensed producer can technically sell any CBD-based products. So until we get uh, either Health Canada changes what they see as other cannabinoids other than THC as a nat natural health product or an additive, uh, I, I think it'll be limited, but it's certainly going to come from hemp. And uh, I'm glad to see anything helping supporting agriculture. So, Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm from Victoria. I work for an LP applicant for processing with a focus on products. Number one question, when do you think realistically we will see these products in the stores? I'm interested in everyone's opinion because I've been hearing a lot. I do go to a lot of conferences and everyone has an opinion on this. Um, I'm going to say probably December of this year. We're going to see initially products, some. That's, that's an aggressive timeline. Uh, you know, I, we, there's no reason to expect uh, Health Canada to implement the new uh, you know, regulations before that one year date, October 17th of 2019. There's a 60 day uh, minimum period for review uh, for any new product format, which then would be December 17th or about a week before Christmas. Uh, now, uh, you know, my experience with uh, Health Canada uh, is such that I think that that, uh, that would be awesome to see. Uh, oh, come and, on, Sam. Um, <laughs> I think in the end, uh, we'll begin to see new product forms trickle out in Q1, Q2, but it may be as much as a, a full year in addition uh, before we see a broad spectrum of SKUs available for sale. Okay. Filling up the pipeline takes time, too. And uh, by that point, we'll have added more stores. You have direct-to-store, central wholesaling, uh, semi-privatized, private distribution in Saskatchewan. Um, with the first go-round, the, the provinces were looking for pretty much two months uh, is what they were hoping for to fill those pipes. Uh, I don't think it'll be that long this time. But yeah, I, th I think it'll be staged. And higher-risk products where the regulator is getting used to them in theory, will take longer to, to guide through the, the regulatory process. But I think some of them are kind of simple and will, will be much quicker. And I, I, there's a possibility they can be shorter than six days. Exactly. They, you know, you can get a, you can apply and they instantly say yes. Yeah. Um, what's the like? Yeah, what are you laughing at? I, what's the so like? I'm skeptical, it but good could if happen. we can do it. Yeah. It could happen. Yes. <laughs> it could happen. But yeah. So the, the, there's... They have stated in a couple of calls that yeah. for the new product formats, there's going to be a 60-day minimum period. Now, previously, it has happened in less than 60. Days, yeah. uh, but their statements thus far have been that it's going to be at least 60 days for these elements. Now, again, what they say and what happens, uh, you know, we'll see. I'm still waiting for GPP guidelines. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to. I want to continue. We're we're just in on time right now. I know uh, our panelists are going to be here for a while. Um, I want to thank you all so sincerely for coming on. I really appreciate it. We're going to take a short break right now. Um, please stretch your legs, and we're going to come back in a few moments with uh, our next guest uh, from RavenQuest.